going to be uh, continuing. We're doing our series on basic Bible doctrines, and we've kind of been doing some subpoints lately. We've been talking about doctrines regarding issues of morality, and this is our, our third one on dealing specifically with issues of morality. So uh, we've got a, another one after this, and then we'll get back into, so I hate to say regular doctrines, but we'll, uh, won't be in a little subcategory here. Let's have a prayer. Father, we do thank you that we have this opportunity to come together uh, this evening to study your word. May we, uh, Father, be students. May we look intently into your word. And as, as we grow, Father, may we help others to grow as well. We want to hold respect. We want to be a people who rightly divide your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I've got, if you notice there on your outline, there's, there's more on the, the back, I, I suppose, than is on, than is on the front, and I'm, I want to cover a lot of material tonight. I think I'll be able to do it, but I have to keep up a pretty good pace in order to cover it, but if we go too fast, you've got an outline, you can look up these scripture verses if we go through them too quick, and you will have them for reference, or if you want to uh, visit with me, you're welcome to visit with me. Um, I say all that because there are three studies that I, as a preacher, usually get the most pushback on. Maybe four. I usually get the most, uh, I'm not buying it. The first one is what the Bible says regarding social drinking, what the Bible says regarding tobacco use, and what the Bible says regarding um, dancing. Those are usually the three, when I'm talking about areas of morality, those are usually the three where you, you get some kickback. And so I, I think it's a topic that is good for us to cover. I think it is one that we have to go and rightly divide the scripture. It really doesn't matter what I think or you think. What matters is what the word of God says. So in this study, we really want to focus on God's word. I would say this, and... and I suppose it applies for every topic, and I've done this when I've had people who've come up and said, I, I hear what you say, I, I, I'm just not buying it. Um, I, I know what you're saying, but I, I don't think social drinking is bad. These are members of the church. I, I get their responses, and my answer is, is not meant to be funny, but my answer is always, you don't have to prove me wrong. It's real easy to prove Donald Gellis wrong. You have to prove the scriptures that have been shared wrong. Tell me why this scripture doesn't answer the question of social drinking. Tell me why this passage doesn't answer the issue of social drinking. So it's not a, a matter of what you and I think. It's clearly a matter of what the Bible teaches. So if we're not going to agree with it, then we have to refute scripture. We have to say that's not what the Bible is saying. So I, I think tonight as we get into our study, we're going to see that the Bible has an awful lot to say. Uh, let's jump in. I give you an interesting little quote there from Abraham Lincoln. He says, alcohol has many defenders, but no defense. And I think that is true, not just in the day and time of Abraham Lincoln, but I think that's true today. We live in a society that is immersed in alcohol. It is everywhere we go. You drive down the highway, you see trucks with, that are uh, transporting alcohol. You see billboards advertising alcohol. I love baseball. You can't go to a baseball game without seeing the stadium with all of these advertisements for alcohol. It's absolutely everywhere. Magazines, books, movies. And there's a lot of defenders. There's a lot of folks out there who would say, I will step up in defense of the right to go ahead and social drink. But while there's a lot of defenders, there's not any good defense about it. And I think people need to understand that. I'm going to begin with some damaging effects of alcohol in society. I think these statistics are very important. They're not my statistics. They come from different sources. Uh, most of them are from the uh, Center for Disease Control and their statistics on drinking. 
Um, there are also, there are statistics on uh, cancers and things of that nature. Um, that's where I got most of them from. But alcohol is a big problem. Alcohol, first of all, is associated with many crimes. 70% of all murders, 41% of all assaults, 50% of rapes, 55% of all arrests, 61% of sex crimes against children, and 50% of spousal abuse cases all relate back to the consumption of alcohol. Now, I think if that were all we had, we would be able to discern as Christians, well, that's not good. I think our understanding, our wisdom would cause us to notice pretty quick if you want to decrease the number of murders, decrease the consumption of alcohol. That's 70% of all murders, more than half. Somebody was drinking. There was alcohol involved in some way. So right off the bat, we begin to see that alcohol comes with consequences. And I think that's the big thing that needs to be stressed. It comes with consequences. When you're looking there at 55% of all arrests, there, listen, people get arrested for all kinds of things. Some are minor and insignificant, and they're in and out in hours. They're, they're just minor offenses. But when you see that, when you total up all arrests that take place, and more than half of them are related to alcohol, that's a lot of individuals. I also give you there on your outline, not only is alcohol associated with crime, alcohol is a safety hazard. 66% of fatal accidents, 53% of fire deaths, 65% of drowning accidents, 50% of all traffic accidents, and 36% of pedestrian accidents have as an element within them the consumption of alcohol. So I'll say the same thing again. If you want to decrease these areas, if you want to lower these areas, well, deal with the consumption of alcohol. Teach people about the consequences of alcohol. Show them how alcohol can be very destructive. Uh, number three there, alcohol is the number one killer. Number one of people 25 years old and younger. That statistic goes down to the age of 12. 25 years and younger, alcohol takes more lives than anything else. So how can you argue that alcohol doesn't kill? It does. We're going to get into just a minute, and just one drink, or I'm just going out and having a few, few drinks. We're going to get into that in, in just a minute, and we're going to come back to the fact that it's the number one killer. 700,000 people a day seek treatment for alcoholism. Almost a million people calling up and saying or contacting people or going to visit with somebody and their plea is, I've got a problem with drinking. I have a problem with alcohol. Now, I certainly understand that people have problems with all kinds of, of other things. I get that. This isn't the only problem they have. But when you have a million people saying, I have a problem, that's something. That shows that it's an issue. 34% uh, of kids from the age of 12 to 20, those are would be underage drinkers, of course. 34% of kids age 12 to 20 say they have engaged in drinking alcohol. Now, this is something that I had to have somebody say to me when my children were young and they were in the home, certainly when they were in high school, that, that concept of never my child. My child would never be in that 34%. No way would my child. You'd be surprised of, of how many of our children fall in that 34%. So we, we have to be, and again, we're giving numbers that percentages don't always show the severity. We're talking millions. All of these statistics, percentage-wise, equate to millions. Okay, so it, it really is a big, a big deal. But from 12 uh, to 20, they've engaged in alcohol. Um, we're starting drinkers off early. 
And again, I think it goes back to advertisement. I think it goes back to sporting events. I think it goes back to athletes in, endorsing um, these types of things. I, I think it clearly goes back to that having an influence. Movies that have an influence of drinking in them. All of these things are leading um, people to say, well, I want to try that or I want to do it or, or, you know, I'm going to go ahead and start off. And they're drinking earlier and earlier. Of the 100 and f of the 100,000 liver, well, let's say 101, of the 101,000 liver disease deaths among people age 12 and older in 2021, that's the latest or the newest statistic I could get. 47.4% of them involved alcohol. Almost half of them destroyed their liver from drinking alcohol. Now, let me tell you what's not in that statistic. What is not in that statistic, these are those who died. What's not in there are those who ruined their liver through alcohol, had a liver transplant, and ruined that one through alcohol. That's not there, but a hundred. It, it's not. It's not broken down to how many of those individuals are. Could we say two-time offenders? I, I don't know how you would phrase that, but but a hundred thousand people, um, forty-seven percent of all those with liver disease was alcohol-related. Those are damaging effects on society. And that's the key thing. If you notice, I give you six categories there. And if you notice, all six categories, you could put them in whatever order you want to put them in, but all six categories involve, involve society. All six. None of this is being done quietly in the corner. None of this is taking place out of the way where, you know, it's not going to have an effect on anybody. I'm not hurting anybody, but I'm raising health care costs. I'm taking up beds and treatment centers. I'm taking up hotlines of people calling in. Oh, but it's just me that's affected. No, it's not. I'm using certain medications that are related to alcoholism. There's more that are affected. Nobody is an island unto themselves. I don't know who came up with that, but they're wrong. It is a societal issue. Out of those six things that I give you, categories, are you ready for this? Christians find themselves in each and every one. Each and every one. Christians are represented in that number. So we can't step back and say, well, that's a worldly problem. It doesn't have an impact on the church. Oh, yes, it does. Sure, it has an impact on the church. I believe it was the fundamentals, not, not independent fundamentals, um, a more liberal branch of fundamentals. I'm trying to, to think charismatic fundamentals. 62% uh, of them drink alcohol or say they, they believe in the acceptance of drinking alcohol. I couldn't believe it. Catholics, it was something like 70, 75%. They drink a lot of alcohol. In Catholicism, they have it at their events. If they're hosting something as a, as a church, they have it at their events. And so, um, you know, you've got 70% of them saying, yeah, it's, it's okay to drink alcohol. Now, I know those are denominations, but those are people um, professing to be Christians. And so people in the world look at them and they say, well, those Christians, I know, quote unquote, those Christians are doing it. Why shouldn't I? Or those Christians are doing it, so it must be acceptable to God. And, and it causes the confusion that we have. So that's the, the damaging effect of alcohol in society. Now let's look at the damaging effect of alcohol on a Christian. And remember, every single one of those statistics has an impact on Christians. Okay? There is damaging effect after damaging effect after damaging effect. Here's some of them. Number one, drinking alcohol makes you a fool. Go over in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 20. Remember, Proverbs is the book of, of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 20, and notice verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. 
And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Some translations say is a fool. And there's two things there that I know you see when it comes to the consumption of alcohol. It being a mocker and alcohol leading to people being brawlers. People fight when they get to drinking. Okay? Um, the thing I give you there on your outline is how can this be? Acting like a fool, being silly, being childish. All of those factor into one being a, a fool. Not having regard for the consequences. I'm going to drink a few drinks. I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to drive 100 miles an hour wrong way down the interstate and hit a minivan with a mom and five kids in it. What a fool that person was. What a fool. So the first thing is drinking alcohol makes you a fool. Here's number two. Drinking alcohol harms your example. And we said this in many different things. People are watching you. People are, are looking at you. Uh, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Beginning or, or down there in uh, verse uh, 12. Let no one despise your youth, Paul talking to Timothy, but be an example to believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. We are to be, you think Timothy's the only one that had to be an, an example? You think Timothy's the only one that it applies to, that nobody else needs to be an example to believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity? He's the only one in the entirety of Christendom that has to do that. That Come on. That doesn't make sense. There's an application that we make to ourselves, our conduct. Be an example in our conduct. Well, this isn't bad conduct. It's not. It's a conduct that leads to 70% of all murders. It's a conduct that leads to 41% of adults, 50% of rapes, 53% of fire death, 65% uh, of drownings. What do you mean it's not bad conduct? Clearly it's bad conduct. In spirit, in faith, in purity. You're telling me that those statistics okay it and say that it's pure? Really? I think we begin to sin. I, I give you some, some notes down here. Um, when we talk about, I'll go over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and beginning in uh, verse 13. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out. And trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. That they may see your good works. And in seeing your good works. What do they do? Glorify your Father in heaven. So you think 60 or 70 percent of all murders involving alcohol is a good work? 61 percent of sex crimes against children is a good work? That's what people are seeing when they see us drinking alcohol. How can that be defined as a good work? Again, you've, you've got to make the argument. You've got to make the argument is no. That doesn't apply to these verses. No, that doesn't, alcohol doesn't have any application to me being salt of the earth and light to the world. Doesn't have any application. That, the, the person has to argue that it doesn't. Now, is this the only area? Is this the only thing that affects our example? No. Tobacco use affects our example. Little kids used to watch everybody in Major League uh, Baseball spitting big wads of chewless, uh, uh, smokeless tobacco out on the fields as they were playing baseball. It would be dripping down their, their cheeks onto their uniforms. And you would have these guys like, like Pete Rose, and, and they would just have tobacco dripping down. You know why they banned it? Because more kids were using smokeless tobacco. 
Why were they using smokeless tobacco? Because of the example. He does it. I want to do it. I want to be a major leaguer. Major leaguers use tobacco. I want to do it. Now, listen, they say that they banned tobacco use in the, um, in the major leagues. That's kind of a misnomer. If you've ever been to a, we, we went and saw the Detroit Tigers play the Cleveland Indians uh, up in Cleveland uh, years ago when the boys were little. And Jim Leland was the manager. And I never saw a guy smoke more cigarettes during a baseball game than I saw him. But what they do is they go out of camera range. They usually step behind it, back behind um, home plate or the side of the uh, dugout, and they smoke back there. I saw all kinds of people smoking back there. Okay, you're not seeing it on TV. I get it. But little Timmy's seeing it. Little Timmy's seeing it. So we have to understand that our example is going to be seen by others. They're going to do what they see us do. If daddy gets drunk and he's in the 50% of people that abuse their spouse in front of their children, guess what happens to Timmy? The chances of him growing up to abuse his own wife skyrocket. Why? Example. Saw daddy do it. Saul, this is how he handled things. Daddy used to drink. Daddy would come home. Daddy would have a good time. Daddy would unwind. Example. It affects people more than we, we uh, think. Um, the thing that I mentioned down there, somebody once told me this, and I leave it on here. I've talked about alcohol many times. And somebody told me it was silly. They told me I was being silly. When I put this idea out there, I said, if alcohol doesn't harm your example then why not have it at our fellowship meals or other gatherings? Well, that's just silly. How's it silly? If social drinking is acceptable for a Christian to engage in, then tell me why we can't engage in social drinking when we come together as a church. And here's usually the argument. Well, the example. Exactly. Well, it might be a stumbling block for somebody else. Exactly. Okay? So I, I don't think that's silly. I think it's a good question. Tell me why. We can't drink when we have a potluck meal, uh, according to this, this, this logic. Um, I find this interesting. Go over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and beginning in verse 13, there's an interesting thing that takes place. And we're, um, we're talking about example. And it's the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit has come upon the, the apostles and they're speaking in tongues and things of this nature. And the people see it. We're talking about example. And the people see it. And it says this. Others mocking said they are full of new wine. This is what the people are saying when they see the apostles. They are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, as you think, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come today in the days past. And he goes on and gives the prophecy of Joel. By what was happening, he saw that people were making a judgment on the example that they were seeing. And Peter had to say, let me correct it. You suppose that we've been drinking? Well, it's early in the morning. You suppose that these men are drunk, but that's not the case. Drinking alcohol can affect our example. Um, let me ask you this question. And I had to deal with this with an elder one time. It, can I come over to your house, me as a, as a gospel preacher? Because if it's okay for you to drink alcohol, then I don't want to hear the argument that it's not okay for me to drink it. I don't want to hear that. We don't have clergy laity in the churches of Christ. I'm not set apart and different from you all. You're not set apart and different from me. I don't, I don't want to hear that argument. Can I come over and play with your children with alcohol on my breath? Can I come over, say, say I was getting ready and I spilt some alcohol. I spilt a beer on my blue jeans. I don't have time to change. I'm patting it down with a towel. I go over to your house and I smell like Budweiser. Are you going to let me do that? Are you going to say that's okay? Are you going to say, listen, Brother Gellis, you don't bring that into my house. You don't come here smelling like alcohol in front of my children. 
You're going to throw me out because it has an impact on our example. I had an elder who was pushing back on this, pushing back and saying, when I go home, I just like to have a, a, a glass of wine, maybe two, I, you know, and just kind of relax a little bit and everything. And I don't see anything wrong with that. And I said, well, let me ask you this as an elder. If a member calls you up and say, I need you to come right away. There's been a tragic accident and brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is, is, is in dire need, has been injured. Are you going to jump in your car and run over there after having two glasses of wine? Are you going to jump in your car and run over there smelling like alcohol in your breath? J.W. said, oh, whatever his name was, J.W. Ambrose, he died, he passed away. J.W. said, you know what? I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. And, and so you have, to, you have to see these things. It, it hurts our example. What if, what if, what if I'm doing, a, doing a, a funeral for one of your loved ones and you've asked me to do it and, and I'm there shaking people hand in the line and as they walk by they can smell the alcohol in my breath I just had one drink but they smell the alcohol what type of example would that did you know the preacher down at the shepherd church of Christ smelled like liquor when I walked by to shake his hand I didn't say I was drunk I didn't say I couldn't carry out my job I did the service and I did it fine but my I'm breathing and they're smelling alcohol you, th you think that would be okay you think you'd want people at a loved one's funeral, uh, saying that the preacher smelled like alcohol? Or you smelled like alcohol? It, it affects our example. That's why we shouldn't do it. Here's the third thing. The, the Christian is called to be sober. It's, it's that simple. Go over to Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, notice verse 18. I know you know verse 19. And he says, Paul says, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. We can talk all day about what it means to be filled with the spirit. And I've got a study coming up on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We'll get to that. But let's focus on the aspect of drinking. And what is the admonishment from Paul to the Christians in Ephesus? Don't be drunk with wine. And then he adds something very interesting in which is dissipation. And I break this down uh, on your outline for you. Uh, one drink will make you one drink drunk. I am told now by preacher friends that I can't say that anymore. That that's not in this day and age, as people have become more educated and more enlightened, that, that preachers can't go around using that phrase, one drink drunk anymore. It, it makes you look uneducated. It, it makes you look silly. But wait a minute. I've never known an individual to be drunk without first taking that first drink. I've never known it. It always happens that way. The interesting thing here is in the Greek, the word, uh, the phrase means to grow drunk. It's a process. How do you grow drunk without taking the first drink? It's like the people who make the argument. You've probably heard this. It, I, 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 try, I, I try not to jump out of my skin when I hear it. But people will say, uh, Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ greet you. And they will make the argument, the Bible never says church of Christ. You all don't even have a name that's scriptural. It says churches of Christ, not church of Christ. If you have a church of Christ over there, <coughs> and you have a church of Christ over there, and you have a church of Christ over there, and a church of Christ over there, and a church of Christ over there, what do you eventually have? Churches of Christ. There has to be the singular aspect of it to comprise or to make up a plural. What is he saying? There are churches of Christ. Why? Because there's individual churches. There's churches of Christ. That, that, that argument, I, I, jump, I jump out of my skin and I say hi to myself. It's, it's the way it always is. Um, the Greek means to grow drunk. Um, how do you grow drunk without drunk without taking the first drink? The other thing here that I chose was the word dissipation. And they don't think the King James has dissipation. 
but the New King James. And it's a word that most people read and just go right over. They never think about what it means. And dissipation involves an excess. Um, be, uh, and do not be drunk with wine in which is excess. Okay, dissipation. It carries the understanding of a descent into drunkenness. It also carries dissipation, the understanding of a descent into sexual immorality. So yes, it means that as well. We're talking about alcohol. So it's used dissipation in the sense of having a descent going down into drunkenness, right? And so then we'll make the argument um, where we say uh, one drink makes you, what, their, their argument is one drink doesn't make you one drink drunk, right? So I'll counter that argument. And we'll see if it's okay. So I'll counter and say one puff on the marijuana cigarette doesn't make you high, does it? One pill that you take, whatever it may be, illicit pill, doesn't make you absolutely right at that second high, does it? But would anybody say it's okay to take the puff or take the pill? Wouldn't they understand that the puff can be followed by another puff and another puff and another puff? Well, sure they do. And a pill can be followed by another pill and another pill and another pill. It, 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 it's, it's just one pill. It's just one puff. Nobody would make that argument. It's just one drink. Nobody would make that argument. The only way for something to lead to excess is to do it the first time. Again, show why these scriptures aren't saying what they're saying. Here's D. Christians are to avoid every form of evil. Go over to 1 Thessalonians. Oh boy, I gotta hurry up. Uh, go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and look at verse 22. Uh, abstain. This is Paul talking to the the uh, church in Thessalonica, and he says many things here. In verse 19, do not quench the spirit. 20, do not despise prophecies. Prophecies. 21, test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now you look at those statistics again and tell me how that's not a form of evil. 50 percent of men are beating their wives and you're telling me that that's not a, a form of evil? Really? 70% 70, 70 of murders are taking place because alcohol's involved and that's not abstaining from evil? I like where he says in verse 21, test all things. Well, look at the statistics. Look at what it says. I can test it and I can show you that alcohol is not good. Hold fast to what is good. What, am I, what good am I going to hold fast to? It's just one drink, Brother Gellis. Do we have to go down this road again? What if I smell like the drink at the, at the funeral? What if I smell it like the drink when I'm standing before the bride and groom at the wedding? What if I smell like the drink when I come over to your house to meet a family member who's in town? What about then? It's just one drink. It, it's, it's the example. It's the example. Uh, in our society, uh, drinking gets portrayed as being uh, no big deal. I give you some examples there. You remember Otis from the Andy Griffith show? You remember who Otis was? He was a town drunk. He was always in jail. Why was he always in jail? He was drunk. And it got so funny where he'd come in, he'd get the key, he'd let himself in and go in. And it's, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. Um, what about gun smoke? Remember Miss Kitty? Miss Kitty owned a saloon and a brothel. I had somebody say to me, I mentioned Elvis, that I mentioned, I mentioned to one lady, you remember, you remember this? I mentioned to one lady that I liked listening to Elvis. And she said, I cannot believe, I was there when Elvis was, was in his prime and he was just, just him moving his hips and everything was, was just, just dirty. And I can't believe you like his singing. You should watch more wholesome stuff like Gunsmoke. Miss Kitty runs a brothel. Miss Kitty runs a saloon. But what do we do? We give it a pass. We give it a pass. And we do that to a, 
to a lot of things. Um, here, drinking alcohol may cause others to stumble. And this is kind of where we were working our way up to. Go over to Romans chapter 14. In verse 13, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. So you can back up um, uh, um, verse 10, but why do you judge your brother or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The thing is, a, is, is a, the context is an um, egotistical judgment. Why are you judging them? Look at your life. Why are you judging them? Look at how you are. That's the context. So when he gets down here and he says, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. It's not like those who come to me and say, see, you can't judge somebody who's consuming alcohol. Are you out of your mind? That would be like saying you, you can't judge somebody who's beating his wife. You can't judge somebody who's, you know, out there committing murder. You can't judge them. That's not the context of it at all. And he goes on and he says, but here's what you need to do. Don't put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Wouldn't the things that we've talked about when it comes to drinking, wouldn't that put a stumbling block in our brother's way? Uh, one drink and somebody seeing you do it may be one drink too many for some. It may be. I don't drink alcohol not only because I believe a Christian shouldn't drink alcohol. I don't drink alcohol because alcoholism is in my family. My dad was an alcoholic. My cousin is an alcoholic. I had a grandfather that was an alcoholic. I know statistically if I start I won't stop. So you, you have to make decisions, even hard decisions. But, but what if you just want to have that, that one drink and you're around me? Well, what about me? What if, why would you put that stumbling block in front of me? Why would you put that temptation in, in front of me? 16% of people who first try alcohol between the ages of 11 and 12 go on to develop a dependence. Drinking alcohol and alcoholism is learned by example. Nobody just stumbles into it one day. Oh, I'm an alcoholic. It's learned by example. Seeing people drink, seeing the advertisements, seeing it taking place in movies and TV. It is learned. It is a learned. And if you watch a lot of stuff today, it's no big deal to go out and get drunk. It's no big deal. Go out and do it. So people are learning uh, this uh, about uh, drinking. Um, are your children, is your spouse, are your friends, are they watching you drink? Then statistically, they're at a higher risk to stumble and become alcoholics. Let me, let me give you, let me, let me put it to you this way. Because since we're talking statistics, let me put it this way. If I said to you, if I said, and this is a real... I mean, I'm making it up, but let's say this is a real statistic, okay? If I said to you, um, mom and dads, 50% of the young girls who go out on prom night die in a car accident. Half of them go out and they die in a car accident. Because, would, would you say, okay, I'm going to wave to my daughter as she drives down the road? Or would you say 50%? Wait a minute, that's too high. 50%? I'm not taking those odds. I'm not going to gamble with their life. 50%? She ain't going anywhere. I don't believe that there is a parent in this auditorium who would wave at their child knowing that the statistic is 50% of them won't come back. I don't believe there's a parent in this auditorium who would say, okay, see ya, go on down the road. I find that just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, kind of follow that out. If your child sees you drinking and statistically they are prone to drink and become an alcoholic, well, what statistic does it have to be before you say no way? Does, does it have to be 80% become 
alcoholics? Does it have to be uh, 74%? Does it have to be only 50%? Does it have to be 25%? What are you gambling with your child? All right? What are you going to gamble? Well, he sees me drinking, but statistically, only 40% of kids are going to get addicted to alcohol. I'll roll the dice and play the odds. On your kid? Really? Really? I don't say this that often because I don't like how it comes across. That's just stupid. That's just stupid. Uh, here's the last thing. Drinking alcohol is a work of the flesh. Uh, go over to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 21. Envy, mur we're cutting into the middle of it. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I can hear the arguments already that people have come to me with. It says drunkenness. It says drunkenness. It don't say one drink. It don't say just a few drinks. It says drunkenness. So you're telling me that out of 50% of spouses who are abused and alcohols involved, the person's a drop-down drunk? Couldn't they just be influenced by a few drinks? Their inhibitions have gone down? You, you mean to tell me that 70% of all murders, the person is drop-down drunk, don't even know how they held the gun, don't even know how they got in a fight with the individual. They're not all drunk. They started with one drink, but they're not totally oblivious to what their actions are. Your inhibitions go down. Your cognitive reasoning it goes, uh, goes down. Um, alcohol, uh, drinking alcohol is a work of the flesh. And I put this on your outline and I mean it. It sure ain't a fruit of the Spirit. I've read the fruit of the Spirit. Drunkenness isn't, isn't in there. Then common objections refuted. I can only give you a couple of these. Let me give you the more common ones. Uh, how about um, um, uh, Jesus turning water into wine in 1 John 2, 1 through 10. You'll have to go back and, and read it. Um, there's a few comments that you can make about that. There's no proof, even though in our society, if we hear wine, we think alcoholic wine. It's just the way we're conditioned. In fact, we think wine like we have today. Wine today has alcohol added to it. We're, we're, you know, we don't even think about what Bible wine, quote unquote, was like. But we hear the word wine and we automatically assume it's alcoholic wine. Uh, Brother Jeff Coat wrote an excellent book called Bible Wines, where he goes over the process in the first century, now 21st century, in the first century. Because I have people, well, never mind. Um, uh, here's the second thing. To give uh, a people who were already well drunk more wine would be a sin. Habakkuk 2 and verse 15 says that. Yet 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says that Jesus was sinless. So how could he give drunk people wine and still be sinless? Guyan Woods noted three things. It's in his commentary. Uh, Guyan Woods noted three stages of wine production that took place in the first century. The first one was non-intoxicating, pleasant, and nutritious. The second was tangy. Something's about, something, something's going on. The third is intoxicating. Now, out of those three, which one would a sinless Savior choose? If he's going to turn alcohol, if he's going to turn water into wine, which of those three would a sinless Savior? It can't be number two, uh, number three, intoxicating. How can it be? Because he would violate Habakkuk 2 and verse 15. And then that would violate 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. So it can't be that one. What about tangy? The process is gone. It started. The process is here. It's giving me. Okay, maybe we wouldn't say tangy today. We would say, mm, it's got a kick. It's got a kick to it. You know, you hear people saying that. Um, is, he certainly wouldn't give people that one. Or would he give them the non-intoxicating, pleasant, nutritious one? The Bible oftentimes says that the wine is in the new grape. And it's true. It's true. But the new grape doesn't make you drunk. The new grape isn't intoxicating. I have literally picked grapes off of a vine in a, in a, in a, in a uh, 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 vineyard. 
And when we lived in Porterville, California, it's called the Fruit Basket of California. I've picked them. You don't get drunk. Um, so we have to ask ourselves that. What is, an, what is an, another one that um, one drink is harmless? Number three, um, if one drink is harmless, then let police, firemen, surgeons, and airplane pilots have just one beer at work or before helping you. If it's just one drink and there's no problem, then, then let them do it. But we don't. You, you get fired if you're a fireman and, you, and you're drinking. Just one drink. You, you get fired if you're a policeman and you're sitting in your police car having one beer. Airline pilots, you want them to fly with just one drink? That's crazy. Um, the other thing that I give you is let the man taking your daughter on a date chug one beer in front of you and take her away in his car. It's just one beer. It's just one beer. Are you going to do that? Are you going to let some punk take your daughter out after drinking beer? Really? I find that hard to believe. And then the last one there, um, if drinking alcohol is okay for a Christian, then let me preach it from the pulpit. If the argument is, we've got some who say, if we have some, that say drinking alcohol, social drinking is okay, then tell me I can get behind this pulpit and I can tell people you can social drink. You can drink alcohol. Now, I, I, I'm not putting anybody on the spot, but I don't think one person here would raise their hand and say, Brother Gellis, next Sunday sermon ought to be on how a Christian can drink alcohol. I don't think one of you would raise your hand. I think I'm right. Bring it to our fellowship meal. If it's okay, bring it to the fellowship meal. But we wouldn't. We wouldn't do those things, uh, would we? No, we, we, we wouldn't do those things. When I did, this is number two. When I interviewed here, um, they gave me a questionnaire. And so, you know, I gauged the soundness of this congregation based off of that questionnaire. I didn't know you all. I know who you were. I know what y'all believe. So the only way that I got an idea of where you were doctrinally is from a questionnaire that they gave me that I answered in front of them and saw what their responses were to the answers. So it says this in the questionnaire. It said, do you believe that a Christian can drink alcoholic beverages for non-medicinal reasons in moderation and be pleasing to God? Notice the key. Can you drink it in moderation and be pleasing to God? I said no. Not one objection was raised. Not one man said, whoa, wait a minute, Brother Gellis, time out. If it's in moderation, it's okay. Nobody, nobody stood up and opposed me in that. And of course, the key there, we're not talking about that type of alcohol that's used in medications. I don't, come on. Uh, let's, let's not be, you know, let's not be silly. So anyway, um, there's some other things on there that you can uh, look at. But, but I, I think the understanding is that should a Christian drink alcohol? No. No. You know why? Because you're a Christian and it's not pleasing to God. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry I had to go so fast.